just read for us, or a portion of it is the launching pad for where we're going to go here today. There is so much that is powerful, that is packed into those five verses that we are not going to unpack, but there's one piece of it that I want to use for us to start off today, and that is this part from um, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus says, therefore go, he's saying this to his 11, who have fought all, the, the 12 minus Judas, who betrayed him and then committed suicide, sadly, um, and did not receive the forgiveness that he might have if he had sought it. That the other 11, then Jesus talks to them and says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The question that I want to ask for us to think about to get going here today has to do with that line and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. How do you know that you're doing that? How do I know that I'm doing that? And there's two sides to that. The one is, how do I know as the object of the teaching, as the person being taught, that I am obeying everything Jesus commanded those 11 guys 2,000 years ago. How do I know? I can also think about it flipped around as a teacher myself because Christians believe that this statement that Jesus made to those 11 wasn't just a statement that he made to those 11, but it's a statement that he made to anybody and everybody who would follow him as a disciple. That very first line, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. A follower, a student of Jesus who is learning to become like their master. So if, if I'm following him and if I'm going to become like him, and he taught people to do these things, and he made disciples, and he expects then me as his follower to do the same, how do I know that I am making disciples? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is bringing them into that real relationship with Christ that we talk about so often. And how do I know that I am teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded them? You can take this question and make, maybe make it a little bit more uh, general by saying, how do I know that I'm growing as a follower of Jesus? How do I know? If you're like me, what you tend to think, sort of the default setting is, well, I'm trying to do certain good things, certain right things, and, and I'm hoping that if I keep doing these appropriate things, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and that while I'm doing these things, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity, is in me and somehow working things out and changing me, that then as a result of that, I'm going to be better, closer, more Christ-like, more obedient in the future than I am right now. And if I look back on my life and I think, am I more Christ-like than I was a year ago? Eh, I, I, I hope so, you know, I think so. Probably, maybe, you know. Well, what about five years ago? Well, okay, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more of a contrast there, I think, or 10 or 15 or, or whatever. And, you know, I mean, hopefully if I, keep, if I keep reading the Bible and if I keep going to church and, you know, if I keep doing what the pastor says and, and so on, then, then eventually I'm going to get better and better and better. But then if I try to think, well, what does better look like? So if I'm actually getting better, what, what, does that, what does that mean practically and concretely? What is, he, what is he building me into? I can say theologically, okay, well, he's building me to conform to the image of Christ, but that seems pretty big. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how, how I know that I'm getting closer to that because it seems like infinitely far away. You know, it just seems kind of abstract and a little bit hard to to sink your teeth into. And everything that I've said so far that I think, I actually think is basically true. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything that contradicts what I just said. What I want to suggest today, though, is to bring some clarity 
to, to try to get some more clarity, to try to turn the lens to get it into focus a little bit better about what it really looks like and means to grow as a disciple. I'm not going to exhaust that topic here today, but what I want to share with you is that in, in the recent past, I've been increasingly exposed um, to a model to sort of define or explain or depict what Christian growth looks like that is becoming a revolution within me. And, and I want to share that revolution with you. I, I want to I stress that what I'm going to tell you is a model. It, it is not something that you can turn to one passage in the Bible and find this entire model spelled out. However, as I'm going to demonstrate today, you can go to individual passages of Scripture, and when you, when you integrate those Scriptures together, and you mix that with a bit of experience and observation and common sense, you can sort of construct a pattern of, this is what growth as a follower of Jesus looks like. But it is just a model, okay? And I didn't make it up, although some of my own thinking is imported into what you're going to see here today and what I'm going to share with you here today. So I want you to take this with a grain of salt. I want you to think about this clearly. I want, you, I want you to compare it with what you see in Scripture. I want you to critique it. I want you to judge it, okay? But at the same time, I want you to be exposed to it, and I want you to consider it. And, and I want you to consider a, a, few, a couple of key questions in it. Now, before I give you those key questions, I, I want to explain sort of as a general principle that what we're going to see is we're going to see um, human biological growth from birth to maturity as a model for spiritual growth, from spiritual birth to spiritual maturity. That's, that's basically the framework that I'm going to sh present to you here today. And again, it's based on passages of Scripture where Jesus and the apostles talk about the spiritual life in those terms, okay? And, and, and so as we look at that, I'm going to trace for you five stages of Christian growth. Five stages of discipleship growth. And I'm going to immediately contradict myself and say that it's actually not five, it's six, because we start with stage zero, okay? So it's actually going to be six because we start with stage zero, but we end up at stage five. And the question that I want you to consider today as you're thinking, as you're reading, as you're taking notes, and I'm going to return to these at the end, is first the question, which stage am I at? As I describe these to you, I want you to think, which stage am I at right now? And the second question being, is it time for me to move on yet? Is it time for me to move on yet? And this question is fascinating and critical and is part of the revolution for me. When you think about biological growth, when you think about the growth of human beings from infancy to adulthood. No sensible person blames a person for acting their age, but they blame a person for not acting their age. Am I right? So I'm thinking about the Montgomerys right now. Now, I should also admit that parents are not always sensible people. Can I get an amen to that? Are there any parents here who have not been sensible people? Okay, so, so sometimes parents are not sensible people and do blame children for acting their age but most people the sensible people in other words when you're looking at somebody else's kid you don't do that okay so I think about the Montgomery's right now and I'm, I'm confident that Nick and Val are not looking at adorable Alex and saying okay Alex you're like you know six eight months old now you know when are you gonna pull your weight around here you know I mean, like, like, come on, you know, make a contribution to the family, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't say that to an infant. That would be ridiculous, right? But I would also bet that when they look at Liam, who's now in these early stages of childhood, right? He's, he's doing a little preschool now. That when Liam acts like an infant, well, then they have a problem with that, right? And they let Liam know about that, right? Okay for Alex to act like an infant, because she is one. Liam, not okay for you to act like an infant. You're a child now, right? And likewise, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with a child acting like a child. But when a young adult acts like a child, we find that shameful, 
right? And, and there's nothing wrong with um, a young adult acting like a young adult. But when an adult who's a parent who has children acts like an adult who does not have children, then we have a problem with that. And we also, when, when we see a parent with young children, we don't blame them for acting like a parent with children, but when there's a parent who treats their children like children, when their children are actually parents with children of their own, we have a problem with that. And rightly so. Now, now, one of the things about the spiritual life, though, that's weird and that's different about biological life is that the model I'm going to show you, though I do believe it exists, it, it never works as clean as this. It's, it's a lot messier and fuzzier than this in real life. With, with biological life, there's a certain clock in our bodies that, you know, like it or not, whether you choose it or not, you, you just start growing up. With the spiritual, and, and everybody grows up at more or less the same rate. I mean, of course, some are faster, some are slower, but they're all pretty much together, relatively speaking. Spiritual life's not like that. Spiritual life, you got some people who grow fast. You got some people who grow slow. You got some people who, who they're spiritual children for five weeks, and you got other people that they're, or they're spiritual infants for five months, and others for five years, and some people for 15 or 25 years. And one of the things that I'm learning, that you're going to be really glad that I'm learning this, is that that's okay. Okay? And that's why I put here, is it time for me to move on yet? Because there, when you're in a particular spiritual stage, there's stuff that God is doing to grow you up in that spiritual stage, and it's not right for you to move on yet. See, my approach, the way I think, the way I am, and you guys know me well, you, you know this is, the, this is the way I am, this isn't going to surprise you, is, is I'm always looking to that next thing. I'm always leaning into that next thing. I'm always thinking, you know, how can I be, you know, stronger, swifter, faster, you know, higher, right? Like the Olympics, right? How, how can I do better? How can I improve? How can we improve? I'm, I'm always looking to level up. But, but what I'm seeing is that in the spiritual life, there's a lot of period of time that it's not time to level up. It's time to get good at the level that you're at. So, so what I'm going to share with you today, you, you might be inclined to think that I'm going to share with you five stages of spiritual growth and that the, that the outcome of that is that I'm telling you, you need to get to stage five right now. You need to get to stage five yesterday. That's not what I'm going to tell you. I'm not even going to tell you, you got to get to the stage beyond where you are right now, which you might expect. But I'm not going to say that because I don't know that. I don't know what God intends to do with you where you are. But it might be time for you to level up. And I want you to consider that today. Okay? So, so let's, let's go through, all right, and let's work through this. And we're going to start with stage zero. And stage zero is spiritually dead. Now, this might seem like a strange place to start. And it is. And that's another one of the differences between biological life and spiritual life. See, with biological life, you start with birth and you end with death. Birth comes before death. But with the spiritual life, death comes before birth. In the spiritual life, you start dead and you're dead before you're born. See, this is what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians. He said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. And, and so the, the starting point is being dead. The, the starting point is that you're born with biological life, but, but spiritually, your spiritual life is not there. You're, you're alienated from God. You're dead in your transgressions and sins. You're, you're dead in your ignorance. You're dead in your, your slavery to your own sinful desires. And, and you don't even know any better. And that's where you are, and that's where you're stuck. And, and, and now that does not mean, and this is an important point, that does not mean that you are emotionally dead. It does not mean that you're intellectually dead. And it doesn't mean that there can't be real change, real growth, real evolution and progress that is happening in your life while you're spiritually dead. I mean, th there's, there's people who go on quite a long journey 
and where God does things in their lives and where they encounter him and they're not sure what they're encountering or they're, they're pretty sure but they don't want it and so they flee the other way, right? So, so it's not like in spiritual death you do nothing. But it is true that in spiritual death that you're, that you're fundamentally disconnected from God, whatever encounters you might have with him. And it's also true that you are doomed to eternal death if you die without getting that resolved. And so the shift that needs to happen in stage zero and what God is working on a person during this stage is the shift from death to new birth. The shift from death to new birth. And, and that shift from death to new birth is something that Jesus talks about in John chapter 3 when he says to Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Okay? So, so biological life is not going to do it, right? It's, it's not enough. There needs to be a spiritual new birth. Okay? So, so how, do you, how do you do this? How do you navigate this from death to new birth? Well, you can't do it yourself unless God takes the initiative with you to bring you into it you can't be brought in. You know, dead men don't raise themselves, okay? But when dead men are being raised, when dead women are being raised, when, when dead children are being raised, then, then there are certain things that happen. And, and if you feel within yourself, if you recognize the need for these things, that's a pretty good sign that you're in the middle of that shift and you better cooperate with it, okay? And those things are admit, believe, and confess the ABC okay it's it's admitting number one that you are spiritually dead you are dead in your transgressions and sins you cannot save yourself you cannot make yourself good you cannot get yourself out of this situation it's believing that in the cross of Jesus Christ the God man who is sacrificed on behalf of our crimes our sins that therefore you can be reconciled to God and to be saved and it's to confess Jesus is Lord. That was the fundamental confession of the early church. And to say Jesus is Lord means two things. It means, number one, Jesus is Lord of everything right now. He is the king. He is the one that's exalted the name above every name. And he's coming back and he's setting up a new kingdom and a new creation. But number two, it means Jesus is my Lord, which means that now I'm going to follow him and obey him. It means that now he's the one who's in charge of my life. And I'm going to walk in his way. Okay? Admit, believe, and confess. That's how you shift from death to new birth. Now, the obstacles for the spiritually dead person are incomprehension and pride. Incomprehension meaning, I just don't even understand this. Like, what did you just say? You know? Like, like I understand English, but what you said sounds like a different language. You know, that's... That's, that's a big part of the struggle at this point, is that you can say it, and it doesn't matter how clearly you spell it out, it just does not compute. But the other thing is pride, right? And, and pride is, no, I, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. No, I'm not that bad person deep down that the Bible says that I have become through sin and through the sin of Adam and Eve, you know? And, and no, I can find another way and I can improve myself, right? That's the pride that gets in the way. And, this, and what happens in this stage is to overcome those things so that a person goes from death to new birth through faith in the grace of God through Christ. Well, once that has been completed, now they've moved on to a new stage. And that's the stage of the spiritual infant. Now, being a spiritual infant um, is, is illustrated here in the, in the book of Hebrews with this text, okay? Okay. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not an, acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Now, he's, he's saying this, the author of Hebrews is saying this to a group of people that he believes should be beyond the infant stage by now, okay? So he's kind of taking them to task. But he is indicating that there is such a thing as infancy. And Paul says something very similar in 1 Corinthians 3, when he's saying to the Corinthians, you know, when I first came to you, you know, I, I gave you milk and not solid food because you weren't ready for the solid food. You know, I mean, like, I needed to give you the basics at this point. And let me tell you something, spiritual infancy is a joyous time, right? Just like when a new baby is born, 
it's a joyous time, right? And people celebrate. The great thing about when a spiritual baby is born is that they're the, the most joyous of all, right? I mean, when you have a, a, new, a new actual, like, like, biological baby, everybody else is happy, but the baby isn't happy. The baby's just babying. You know, the baby's just doing what a baby does, you know. But a spiritual baby is thrilled. They're excited. They're happy. They know Jesus now. You know, it's wonderful. But infancy is also a very needy time. Am I right? I mean, when you got a, when you got a baby, that baby needs a lot and can contribute nothing towards getting his or her own needs met other than crying to let you know that you need to meet those needs. And, and there's a lot of that that goes on in spiritual infancy too. Because very often when a person comes into that, um, what, what brings them to Jesus in the first place, for most people, not all people, but for most people is not just some spiritual quest, but it's because there's something very concrete that is painful and difficult that's going on in their lives. You know? Like sickness, like um, a, bra a marriage breaking down, like unemployment, like uh, addiction that they can't get out of. You know, there's, there's very often something bad that's going on and they've come to Jesus to get help with that bad thing and in the course of it they realize that they have sins that need to be forgiven too and oh boy, I guess hell is even worse than this stuff. So, you know, let me get that dealt with and then they come into the family and they're happy and they're excited and everything but they still have all these other problems and they require a lot of attention and a lot of care from a lot of people to help walk them through those things. It's very, very natural. And the, and the period of spiritual infancy involves a shift from ignorance to belief because they just don't know a lot of stuff. There's a lot that they don't know. And so, and so it's this shift so that they start to know these things. That's why the author of Hebrews is saying about talking about teaching the elementary truths of God's word. Okay, so spiritual infancy is when we're going into the Bible, we're going into God's word and saying, let's get down to the basics. Let's get to the basics of doctrine. Let's get to the basics of just the Bible, its construction itself. What is it that it's a book, but there's 66 books in it and chapters and verses and when was it written? And, you know, basics like that, um, basics of behavior. You know, basics about just what does it mean to do Christian? You know, what, what does it mean to live this way? Very, very basic stuff because they don't know any better. And so it's, it's exposure and then taking them from not only exposure so they recognize it, but then that they believe it. And, and therefore the obstacles, the things that, that the spiritual infant is grappling with and encountering with are worldly opinions, beliefs, and relationships. See, they've been trained, they've been built in worldly opinions. Now there's biblical teaching that's contradicting the conventional, contradicting the conventional wisdom of the world. And they have this struggle of, well, the Bible says this, but I've always believed this. You know, so this is the period of time where, where people like struggle with the Bible saying that Jesus and belief in Jesus, faith in Jesus is the only way to salvation. Because the world doesn't believe that. So, so now there's, a, there's friction here, you know, or, or, um, uh, you know, or behaviors, you know, about what, what, what we do with our body, right? Um, what we do with our mouth, what we do with our money. You know, the Bible has all kinds of teachings about that. What we do with our time, all right? But, but they've been formed in a completely different sort of way that seems reasonable out there. And so they're beginning to feel that pain of the shift away to a, to a different identity, to a different walk, a different way of looking at things and functioning from what they've experienced up to that point. And moreover, they've got relationships still that that don't understand the shift that they've made in their lives and now there's friction and tension in those relationships and are those relationships going to stay whole or are they not going to stay whole or are those relationships going to pull them back in, right? And so those are the kinds of things that the spiritual infant is dealing with. But after a while, when these things get resolved and when, when a, a, a person comes to a point that they, that they have the basics nailed down and believed, the basics of faith, the basics of Christian moral behavior, and they're living according to that, the basics of Christian practices like prayer and worship, you know, and so on and so forth, these sorts of things, then they move up, they grow up, and become spiritual children. And the author of Hebrews has something to say to spiritual children as well. He says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. 
For what children are not disciplined by their father? God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, I want to stress something right now. For our whole lives as believers and into eternity, we are to be childlike. We are to be childlike. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 18, 3, he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So in one respect, being a spiritual child is a permanent experience. It is a permanent experience of recognizing uh, the, the Father's love and receiving his grace and being humble within ourselves and not uh, resting on our own strength and wisdom, but rather resting on his. That's eternal. But here I'm talking about a particular stage of development. Now, childhood is a fun time in many ways because as a child, you're still not responsible for anybody but yourself. And I'm extending childhood here to even upward into what we call the teenage years to a certain extent, okay? When you're a child, you aren't responsible for anybody but yourself. That's the good news about being a child. The bad news about being a child is that being responsible for yourself is no fun. <laughs> that, that's the problem. And children are beginning to learn this, right? You know, when you're a child, you, you have to start regulating your behavior consistently in a way that you didn't have to do when you were an infant, you know? You, you have to wash your hands now. You have to, you know, not interrupt people when they're talking. You have to do your homework. You have to control your temper. There's all these things about behavior that you didn't have to limit. You didn't have to self-regulate. And now you've got to self-regulate. And that's not fun. And you still have this childlike desire that life should be fun. I like to have fun. I want things to be fun. And you're starting to learn that there's a significant portion of life that just isn't fun. And this is a problem. Okay, and, and in spiritual childhood, things keep getting harder. For many people, when they start out in the Christian life, God just dumps grace on them, right? I mean, there are like miracles that happen in their lives, right? There's like healings that happen in their lives. There's, you know, repaired relationships that happen in their lives. I mean, learning the Bible just comes easy. It's exciting to read the Bible. I want to read the Bible every day and I'm slurping it down. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. It's fun. It's great. But then in spiritual childhood, you start to hit some things that are problems that don't go away as fast as the problems used to go away. There was that one sin that you kicked, you know, lickety split when you first became a believer. But now there's this other sin that you keep falling into over and over again. It's like, God, what's the deal? Why do I keep going into this thing? Right? And, and, there, are, and there are things that, that you, it used to be you learned them and you learned them real quick. And now there's things you're finding in the Bible that you just don't know how they add up. And there are struggles that you have. And you're thinking, man, maybe, is this true? Did I sign up for the right thing? I think a great example of this, um, or what, what, what all of this is, is it describes the shift from feelings to habits. From feelings to habits. When you start out in the Christian life, you got a lot of feelings to go on, and that helps, it's like rocket fuel. It helps to propel you into orbit. But then once you're there, the rocket fuel has been spent. It's burnt out. And now the Christian life consists of living on these habits and building on these habits and functioning even when you don't feel like it. I think a great example of this is with coming to church. Okay? Coming to church. I've seen it. You've probably seen it. You've probably experienced it yourself. Okay? When people first come to faith in Christ, they can't wait to get to church. I mean, they're in church every week. They are excited to be in church. Not all the time, but a lot of the time they are. Right? Because this is where the Christians are. And this is where the truth is. And it's wonderful and it's great. But then after a while, church becomes kind of a chore. I mean, it's still good, but it's not as exciting as it once was. And there are other things that are going on. And there are other concerns. And it becomes easier to, you know, skip this week or skip that week or skip that other week. And one of the crises that really hits the, the, the spiritual child is, well, I don't feel like going to church anymore. So does that mean that, 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 that my Christian life is falling apart? I don't feel God's presence anymore. So does that mean that God has abandoned me? 
I don't feel like reading the Bible anymore, so does that mean I've lost my way? No, it doesn't. It means you're growing up. That's what it means. That's what it means. God is not content to let you fly in the spiritual life by feelings. He is raising children. He is going to build you up and build your character and build your discipline so that these things that you learn to do as an infant, you keep doing even when you don't feel like it anymore. The obstacles that a child has to deal with are the claims on your time, first of all. We all have claims on our time. And, and the, the challenge for the spiritual child is learning to recognize the claims of Christ and the claims of being a Christian as a claim on their time that is a priority above the other claims on their time. And, and, it's, and it's dealing with the lure of comfort. When it was comfortable to be a Christian, it was great. Now it's not comfortable to be a Christian. Will I still function as one? That's, that's the big challenge that spiritual children are wrestling through. That practice of moving from feelings to habits. Well, in time, if growth continues, they do move from feeling to habits, and the Christian becomes a spiritual young adult. The habits have been formed. They do their duty because they know that it's right, because they know that it's good, because they know that it's nutritious, but now there's a new phase. And spiritual young adulthood, I think, is well represented by the example of Timothy, in the New Testament, who is a protege of the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This is a picture of not just a son in the faith, but a grown son in the faith who's working alongside his dad. You know, it's not just Paul, you know, Paul's company. It's now Paul and son company, right? And so Paul is doing this and he's got Timothy doing it along with him. He can send Timothy to another city to operate on his behalf because he knows he, that Timothy is trustworthy. He knows that Timothy is going to represent him well. He know that, knows that Timothy has been well trained and he's going to do the right thing. And that's what spiritual adults are. Spiritual adults are people who've been built up in discipline and in knowledge enough and in character enough and in skill enough that they have significant strength and capacity for God's work. They are now invested in the work of God at a level that they were not before. These are your people who in the church are your pillars, right? These are your people who are your hardcore contributors. They are there all the time. They are there when the doors are open. They are volunteering. They are serving. They are making the machine run, right? These are your spiritual young adults. But the other thing about it is that there's also a heavy toll that is taken by God's work. They've now carved out the claims of Christ and the claims of the church in their lives, but that is a burden sometimes that can be hard to shoulder and hard to be under. The shift that happens for the spiritual young adult is the shift from self-interest to kingdom interest. From self-interest to kingdom interest. What does Paul say to Timothy? He says, everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself. So let me illustrate again using that, that example of coming to church on a Sunday, okay? Spiritual infants come to church on Sunday because they like it. Spiritual children learn to come to church on Sunday because it's good for them, right? They learn like, I might not like it, but it's good for me. I need it. It's nutritious, right? It's eating my broccoli, Okay, like I don't like it like I like eating the ice cream, but I need to do this. So I'm here and I'm doing it and I'm doing it because of deferred gratification, right? I'm not coming to church because it's fun today, but I'm coming because I know that I need it. And on Monday morning, I'll be glad that I came to church on Sunday. That's what a spiritual child is learning. A spiritual young adult goes to church because God wants them there. That's the difference with the spiritual young adult. They're, they're not coming to church because they like it, though they might. They're not coming to church because it's good for them, though it is. They're coming to church because even if, it's, even if it does nothing to help them right now or tomorrow morning, because God needs them at church. 
Because God deserves to be worshipped. And, 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 and what God wants, God gets. And because God has other people in the church who need to be served. And I say with Isaiah, here am I, send me. So I'm coming to the church to help to serve other people. I'm coming to church not for me. I'm seeing other people. I'm seeing God's work in the kingdom. And that's why I'm involved. That is a huge shift of mind that has to happen in the spiritual life. And you know what? It, it doesn't happen earlier in the spiritual life, nor is it supposed to. Okay? That's, that's the important thing here. It takes some time to get here. Okay? But this is a shift that needs to happen. Now, the, 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 thing, the, the other thing that you might wonder here is, okay, so what's in the way of that? Well, the obstacles at this point are place, pastor, people, and programs. Because those are the things that draw people to a church. Those are the things that people like about the church. I go to church because I like where it is. I go to church because I love the pastor. I go, notice how I said like where it is, but love the pastor. I go to church because, because I love the people. The people are great people and I love them. I come to church because the programs are really great. I like how I'm fed by the programs. I like how my kids are fed by the programs. Or, or it's a program that I like to serve in and I want to serve in that way. You see, those, those are the things that draw people in, which is good. No problem, no judgment, that's good. But the spiritual adult can't stay there. The spiritual young adult has to say that I'm not here, I'm not doing Christianity because the place, the pastor, the people, and the programs are valuable to me. I'm doing Christianity because of the vision that God has given our church to reach other people for Christ in the kingdom of God. That is why I come to church. That's what I'm in it for. It's not about me, it's about him and his glory, and it's about what he's doing in the world. That's a tough, tough shift to make. That's a shift of taking self off the throne in the big way. It's a tough one to do. Now, you might be wondering at this point, what in the world stages could there be beyond this, right? I mean, like, man, a, a church full of spiritual young adults, holy cow, you know, what a, what a dino, dynamo of a church that would be, right? That's incredible. I mean, I can tell you as a pastor, I'd be thrilled if this church was 100 spiritual young adults, man. We would be rocking and rolling. It'd be awesome. But you know what else would happen? That church would die in a generation. It would die in a generation. Because a population that doesn't have kids dies off in one generation. It doesn't matter how many there are. It doesn't matter how hard they work. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how committed they are. If they don't have spiritual children, it dies. And let me tell you something. The church that I pastored that before I came here was a church that consisted of a, a tiny um, remnant of people who had been spiritual young adults, solid, devoted, committed believers for 40 years and did not have spiritual children in their community. It's a scary thing, right? So we got to level up, right? So what's beyond spiritual young adult? That's when you get to spiritual parenthood. Stage four is being a spiritual parent. So being a parent means first that you conceive and give birth to a child and then that you raise that child. Right? So baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is giving birth to a new spiritual baby and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That is raising that spiritual baby. That's what spiritual parents do. Now here's another place where the analogy with biological life breaks down. Okay? And, and it's this. Biologically, babies cannot have babies. Right? But spiritually, they can. Spiritually, you can be newborn in Christ the very next day, tell a spiritually dead person about what happened to you, and that person becomes newborn in Christ, and you just had a baby right there. Okay? So spiritually, babies can have babies all over the place, and should at any stage up to this point. All right? But it's the raising thing that's key, right? Because you cannot raise a child beyond your own level of maturity. And so the significance of spiritual parenthood is that this is a level of maturity where people are, are intentional about raising spiritual children. This is what's going on. The, 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 difference between, the difference with being a spiritual parent as opposed to leading other people to Christ and sharing Christ with people and building up Christ in people in the previous three stages is that at stage four spiritual parenthood, raising spiritual children becomes your dominant Christian activity. When you're a spiritual young adult, you conceive of your dominant Christian activity in terms of the church organization and institution, or maybe other organizations and institutions. 
or maybe your personal service of neighbor, love of neighbor. But when you become a spiritual parent, you conceive of the heart of your spiritual activity as making and raising spiritual children. That is what you think about. That is what you dream about. That is what you eat, sleep, and breathe. That is what is running your life now. Now, spiritual young adults do a great job raising their biological children as, as spiritual children too, okay? So, so generally, spiritual infants, when they raise their biological children, they don't become saved. Spiritual children, when they raise biological babies, biological children, they might become saved. Spiritual young adults, when they raise their biological kids, they get saved. They do a pretty good job getting saved, okay? But we can't be satisfied with just our biological offspring becoming believers because the call of the kingdom is way bigger than that. And also, our biological children are under threat by a hostile world. And we need to be taking the fight to the world. I don't mean in a harmful way, but I mean winning captives from the devil to come to Jesus Christ. So what Paul says to talk about spiritual parenthood is he says, I am writing this, this is this church at Corinth, he says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. You see that? that that's how Paul thought. That was his, that was his approach to things, right? I'm, 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 ma- I'm growing up spiritual children here. And the shift that has to happen between young adulthood and parenthood is the shift from serving people to growing people. You've been used to serving people. My Christian life is serving people. I come to church and I serve people. I go out in the community and I serve people. And you know what? We never stop serving people. Okay? We never stop serving people. That's all good. But we've got to make the shift at stage four to growing people. Where I'm not just serving people and that's the end. I'm serving people because it's a part of growing them up in Christ. And I'm intentional and relational about sharing Christ with them and about building them up in their faith so that they become more mature. And I'm looking at people through that lens and through that way. And the, the obstacles to this are institutional routine, number one. As spiritual young adults, we've just gotten so used to doing the, the routine of serving in this organization called the church that we no longer look at it as people to be built up anymore. And so, so we've got to be intentional about, about as deliberate and building into our calendar, building into our to-do list, our shepherding of people as we build into our calendar our serving in the church. And the other thing that, that can, that can um, hold people back is a lack of confidence. It's a belief. Think, think about when you were a first parent, for those of you who have been parents. You have the kid, you bring the kid home, and it's like, oh, shoot, what did I get myself into, right? Like, like now what? Like, how, what am I supposed to do with this kid? I don't know what to do, you know? And you kind of freak out a little bit, right? Spiritual parents often do the same thing. It's like, I don't know how to raise a spiritual baby, you know? I don't know how to share my faith with somebody. I don't know how to grow him up in Christ. I don't know how to talk to him, you know? It's a... You know, but, but what, what happens, right? When you bring that baby home, you know, my parents, Kelly's parents, they come home and like, it's going to be okay. You can do this. Let me show you how, right? Let me show you how to do this. And then you can do it on your own. And that leads us to stage five, the spiritual grandparent. All right? The spiritual grandparent. The spiritual grandparent is the capstone of this. And Paul describes it this way. as he's writing to Timothy, he says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Let's look at, at the number of generations in this one verse. The things you have heard me, that is Paul, say. That's generation number one. The things you have heard me say. That's Timothy. That's generation number two. And trust to reliable people. Those are the people Timothy's talking to. That's generation number three. Who will be qualified to teach others? Boom! That's number four. So we actually see spiritual great-grandparenthood here in this one verse. And let me tell you something. What happens is a parent makes disciples. A grandparent makes disciple-makers. All right? I'm going to say that again. A spiritual parent makes disciples. A spiritual grandparent makes disciple makers. 
It's the shift from addition to multiplication. We are no longer adding people to the kingdom. We are multiplying the kingdom, right? We got the power of the multiplication so that the kingdom spreads like wildfire on planet Earth. Let me tell you something, people. Spiritual grandparents are why the church exists today. Why the church exists today and did not die in the first century is spiritual grandparents. The reason that you're a believer today is spiritual grandparents. The reason that the church exists in more places on earth than any, place, than any time before in history is because of spiritual grandparents. If we do not have spiritual grandparents, we will not reach the nations and Jesus Christ will not return. Spiritual grandparents are the key. The obstacles to spiritual grandparenthood, to go from parent to grandparent, is number one, your own competence. By the time you get to this point, you've actually become very, very good at making disciples. So good at making disciples, and so well known at it, that it's easy to lapse into the mindset of, if you want something done right, then you do it yourself. And so the hard thing is to realize that one of the disciples that you're making also needs to make a disciple and might not make a disciple as well as you, but they need to get going at it. And there's so many people out there you could help. There's so many people out there you could touch. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus healed thousands of people. Thousands of people. He preached to thousands upon thousands of people. And you know what he did sometimes? That there were all these people coming to be healed? He said, time out gets in a boat with 12 guys and crosses a lake. Leaves the country with 12 guys to talk. Why? Because the suffering of all those other people didn't matter? Why? Because all those other people had it all together? That they didn't need any more teaching? No. Because Jesus knew that in order to ultimately reach the people who needed to be reached, he needed to invest in a few and make them into the disciple makers who were going to reach the nations. And those guys did the very same thing, and the people who followed them did the very same thing, and here we are today. That is how the kingdom spreads, my friends. And so I'm going to swing back to these two questions to close. Number one, what stage am I at? So you've, you've heard the stages, and you know what? Again, real life is not as neat and clean in this. It is not. You might see yourself represented in multiple stages. I would not be surprised. You might say, well, I was at one stage, but I think I've actually fallen backwards to an earlier stage. I'm not surprised by that either, okay? This is a model. It's not a straight jacket, right? This is a synthesizing what we see in the Bible. It's not just spelled out right there, okay? But use it as a lens. Just use it as a diagnostic tool. What stage are you at? And then the follow-up question, is it time for you to move on yet? Either the answer is yes, which means you need to level up, or it's no, I need to keep growing where I am. Whatever the shift is, whatever the obstacles are that I'm encountering right now, I just need to keep seeking God to give me the help to overcome those obstacles. Either way, there's growth, okay? It's just a question, am I growing in the stage I'm at or am I growing into the next stage right now? Kelly's going to play a song. She's just going to play it instrumentally. We're not going to sing it. But she's going to play a song through a little bit and it's a time of reflection for you to consider these questions and to take those before the Lord. And then we'll conclude.